I tried to go to your YouTube. You didn't have one. How do I send a link to this? Do I go to Sales Hustler and share it? They will take care of everything for you. You too. Okay. What's that noise? Hold on. Do I go to Sales Hustler? No, they'll take care of all that sharing it for you. Okay. They'll share it to your, uh, Chad and those guys will share it to yours, Sales Hustlers everywhere. Good. Okay. okay. Facebook Nation, it's Sales Hustlers Live. I think we're live now, we're ready to go. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. It's 5.30 and that means it's time to new, meet our new spotlight. Our new spotlight tonight is Mabel Peralta. Yes, I'm excited. She's our first lady on the show. We've had four men straight and now we get a little taste of the ladies and get to uh, find out what it's like to, to be a lady in the car business, all right? what they deal with, if there's anything different. And uh, we're really excited to have her. Now, before we, I introduce you, I wanna make sure everybody knows, if everybody that's in here right now could hit share for me, okay? We'll get this out to everybody. Chad, if you could share this to Mabel's uh, timeline as well as Sales Hustlers, we can get this out to people. Everybody that shares will get a free month of quick page service. That's pretty cool, Chad's offering that to you. Also, if you can, at the end of the show, in the last 10 minutes, we're going to take your questions. Mabel and myself, put them in the comments. I'll ask her um, any comments or any questions you might have. Um, just, just put them in there, man. We'll get them to her. Mabel, I want you to say hi to everybody in Facebook Nation. Hello, everyone. How are you? <laughs> we're so excited to have you on, Mabel, just to let you know how this works. When I talk... It'll flip to me, and then when you talk, it'll flip to you, okay? Okay, perfect. Um, I know a lot of people are excited right now. They're excited because they want to learn more about you. You probably have flashed in everybody's timeline with your unique style, your great glasses, and, uh, you know, Volvo, man. Volvo is lucky to have you. I want to. I wanted everybody in here to learn a little bit about you tonight. So, first of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Um, I'm originally from New Jersey. I grew up in Union City, New Jersey. I currently live in Beacon. So my commute is pretty long. As some of uh, my fans know, I, I commute almost two hours each way. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, yeah. Two hours each way? Almost two hours each way. Oh my gosh. Girl, you got to move. Eventually I'll move. My lease is up in March, but you know, uh, they made me an offer, um, kind of like the Godfather, made me an offer, couldn't refuse, but really what did it for me was, uh, this is the number one Volvo store in the, actually in the world right now. And uh, the way they presented it to me, they're like, we're the number one Volvo store. You're the number one Volvo girl. We should be together. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I, I have prior commitments, but you know, sometimes life has a really funny way of doing things. And, uh, it just so happened that the universe said, no, you're going to be at that store. And that's exactly what happened. So I've been here now. Um, it's going to be, yeah, it's been a little over a month. Awesome. Uh, before we get to Volvo too much, I want to find out a little bit about you first. Okay. Where, where are you from originally? Tell me a little bit about your family and stuff. Like uh, that. My, uh, my parents are Dominican. So my dad um, came here probably in his early twenties. He's a, well, was a mechanic by trade. And my mom came over when she was 14 uh, as a nanny. So uh, I come from two very hardworking people. And uh, my father collectively had 10 children. My mom only had me. So I always have to give that disclaimer because if not, she'll get so mad at me. Like, I don't have 10 kids. And I'm like, I know, I know. Uh, but out of his 10 children, I'm actually the only one that is into cars. I'm the only one that is like obsessed with cars, the smell of, you know, sometimes I go into behind me the service area. I'll go into the service area and I've done this at every dealership I work at. And I literally walk in every morning just to get like a, a sniff. Like I want to smell the oil. I, and it's because it reminds me of my dad. Uh, luckily, my time clock is in the service area, so I don't have to look creepy when I do it now. I can just pretend like I'm, I'm clocking into work uh, to, to check out the service area. But, yeah, I mean, you know, I grew up an only child. Uh, again, I do have siblings, but I uh, didn't grow up with them. But it's definitely, it's always been cars ever since I was small. My uncle had a 240 when I was growing up. 
And that car to me was the epitome of awesome, even though 240s are just very, very square. But I thought it looked like a Lego piece. And I was like, this car is just amazing. And I told him, when I get older, my first car is going to be a Volvo, but it's going to be a station wagon. And uh, he laughed and he's like, you don't want this car. And I'm like, I do. Um, And that was my first car. It was a navy blue 240 station wagon. What did you name it? Betty. Okay. Old. <laughs> always going to name your car my wife does yeah. that name some all she's been yeah my uh my second wagon was named darth vader who now uh my friend lynn up uh in mass owns owns him and now my second car is known as the torque wagon within volvo circles but he's known as darth 2.0 but today he was known as speedy gonzalez because i got caught speeding <laughs> okay so we have Ten brothers, half brothers and sisters. Yes, half brothers and sisters. My mom only had me. I'm the only spawn. <laughs> Are you close with all your family? Um, I am close. I try to be closer to them. Um, it is hard. Being in this uh, industry is just really, really hard. As you know, the hours are long. Um, your your customers are constantly calling you, especially me that I have to travel. I mean, I really have. Uh, only a few hours of opportunity to be on the phone. So it's either from 9 to 11 while I'm driving in or from 8 to 9, 30, 10 o'clock when I'm driving home. Um, am I close with my siblings? I am to an extent. I would like to be closer. But, you know, when you grow up different in a different environment, it's hard sometimes to relate. Uh, but I am as close as I can get. So definitely they know that if they ever needed me, they can call. That's not a problem. Uh, and vice versa, but, you know, I tend to, I'm a very strong, independent person, so for me to actually call out is really, it's rare. I tend to just fix things myself, like, all right, this is happening, I'm going to handle it, I got this. So when you say they grew up in a different environment, were they in the Dominican then? No, they grew up, uh, they grew up in the city, they grew up in Washington Heights. Um, It's really how you're raised, so my mom raised me where, you know, my parents divorced when I was young, and my mom was very independent, and she raised me that you need to pretty much fend for yourself. So weekends, every weekend we went to the city. Uh, we spent time with my uncle. If not, we went to a museum. You know, she's not a foodie, but she would make me try different foods because she was like, you know, if you're going to be a woman of the world, you need to know what's out there. She enforced me being bilingual. So uh, when I grew up weekends, we only spoke Spanish. Uh you know, if I said anything in English, I would get in trouble. So from 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday after Saturday morning cartoons till Sunday at 8 o'clock at night, only spoke Spanish. And, uh, what was your favorite cartoon, by the way? You got me on the cartoons. <laughs> Thundercats. Okay, I love that. Thundercats, oh! Yeah, Thundercats. That was, my, that was my jam in third grade. I love Thundercats. But, you know, she um, when I was growing up, being bilingual was not... A good thing. It was uh, frowned upon. And she told me one day, you're going to see the benefits of being bilingual. And I hope that you won't, you know, look at look back at this in a bad way. And she was absolutely right. Um, definitely has helped me with my customers who are of Spanish descent. Um, I even know Italian. And I'm currently trying to learn Japanese because I have two hours to drive in the morning. So I have nothing else better to do than to learn Japanese. <laughs> right. All right, so like uh, you you go to high school, all right? After high school, do you go to college after that? I didn't want to go to college. I actually um, did not want. I was not a very I was not a very good student. Being I I suffer from insomnia, so I'm never I'm always up. That's the the running joke with my friends is I'm a vampire, um, and I didn't want to go to school. I figured you know what's the point? I don't want to waste money. I don't want my mom to spend money. And my mom was like, listen, if you, pretty, if you want to survive or you want to live under this house, you're going to have to go to school. I don't care what you do. You need to get a degree. You cannot be my daughter and not have a degree. So I did this thing called AmeriCorps, which is a domesticated Peace Corps for a year uh, to save money, to get grants for school. And then I was like, all right, so what do I want to do? Um, and I thought, well, I love to cook. So let me go to culinary school. And my mom was thrilled. But then I love photography. So I made it a toss-up. So I said, all right, if I get accepted to culinary school, I'll go there. If I get accepted to photography school, I'll go there. I got accepted to both. 
Um, and then I thought, I don't want to cook. I don't want to be a chef the rest of my life because I love food. And I feel like if, I, if I'm a chef, I'm going to end up hating food. And I chose photography. And, uh, you know, I got my associates and then I got my bachelor's. And I got burnt out because everyone was a photographer, you know. And uh, I just didn't like the way it was going. So I started working towards, like, the back end of the production. So I started working with companies that did, like, websites and things like that. So my my background is really within marketing and branding. So I worked with a company called Future Brand, which is owned by, uh, I think now they're owned by McCann Erickson, which is a huge advertising company. I worked with Getty Images, Corvus. I worked with a furniture company called Knoll, which I love because I love mid-century furniture. My whole apartment is very Mad Men-esque. Um, and then finally, before I got into the car business, I worked with Bed Bath & Beyond Corporate uh, and more on their e-commerce side. But, you know, what happens? You're at work, you're typing away at your computer, and all I could think about all day was Volvos. All I could think about was these cars and the car shows and the car meets and the people I've met and how am I going to get in there. And I don't have any automotive experience, so I took a gamble. And um, I put my resume together, very fancy resume. I mean, it has photos and icons. It's pink and blue. I, <laughs> it's crazy. And um, I went to the dealership where I bought my last car, uh, Smythe Volvo, who is one of the oldest and well-known uh, Volvo dealerships in the country. And I pretty much kind of pestered them to hire me. And I said, look, it's either you guys hire me or I go to corporate. And uh, they hired me as a marketing assistant. And that's how I started. So I didn't even start in sales until a year and a half of being in marketing on the dealer side. And I saw how the salespeople were selling cars. And I thought, I could do this. I could do this. I could run circles around you. I could do a better job. There's not that many women selling cars. There's not that many women selling Volvos. I'm going to do this. And uh, I had really amazing support at Smythe. Um, they really were excited that I wanted to take that step. So I took that step. And then two months later, I ended up at another dealership. Uh, they were like, you know, we want you to come on board. And I was there for a year. That was Volvo of Danbury. Um, and again, you know, life has a funny way of, of showing up. I, I met uh, the fine folks here at Glen Cove at a Volvo event. And apparently they've been following me for a long time. And they just thought we need to get her in our store. Um, and I, you know, I was very thank you, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, and I've had a lot of dealerships come after me, like, we want you, we want you. And, you know, you got to play your cards right. And you got to know sometimes being hasty in decisions is not the best. And I like to take my time. And um, I'm glad I did. I'm, I'm glad I did. Well, what's interesting you said there is, of course, your apartment looks very madmanish. Okay. <laughs> of course it does. I couldn't see it any other way. I can see, I see very clean lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I can see your apartment now, so. Yeah, um, it, is, uh, it is seriously very six, very 60s, very vintage. Um, it's something I bring into my attire. You know, you'll never catch me wearing pants. I'm a huge advocate that, you know, I think I was born in the wrong age because um, I'm all about the, like today I'm wearing a big poofy skirt. I'm all about let's, you know, I'm, I'm selling cars. So I don't want to, and no offense to anyone who wears pants, kudos to those women that do. I congratulate you, but I cannot wear pants. I feel weird, and I don't know what to do. I look like a little baby gazelle walking in because <laughs> I'm tall. So I do the skirt thing. But uh, in my mind, it's the 60s, and that's how I dress. How tall are you? Without heels, um, five, six. If I stand up straight, five, six and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Like, obviously, anybody that knows you or follows you knows your unique style. That's the first thing they see about you. The yeah. frame, the colors, the big frames, the very pointy frames that are very 50s. Mm -hmm. kind of, okay. Um, the way you dress, obviously, uh, kind of takes you back to the old school, which, which obviously makes you unique today. Was that just the, always the way you dressed? Or is this something that was more of a, uh, you, you worked yeah. yourself, I mean, it's a it brand new um Definitely in the comments section, once we're done, I'm going to post my high school prom photo. And in this prom photo, you'll see me wearing a Jackie O pillow box hat with a veil. 
and a very 60s outfit. Uh, I've always been into this style. And, you know, growing up, I grew up in a very urban environment where, you know, I love hip hop. I really do. So, you know, my musical tastes are all over the place. But growing up in an area that was really urban, very hip hop, at that time, the girls were really into baggy clothes and things like that. And don't get me wrong, I, I still own a pair of bamboo earrings, actually two pairs. Um, but I always tended to dress more vintage. You know, I would go to Salvation Army and buy the clothes. If they didn't fit me, I would alter them to fit me. I just thought it was so beautiful and so classic, um, you know, that people always dressed up. Even to go to the airport, it was like a big deal to dress up. And I feel like that is lost right now. Um, I've done some mystery shopping. I've gone to other dealerships, you know, just to see how it is. And sometimes I'm sad because I'm like, my God, you, as a woman in the automotive industry, you have such an advantage. And I'm not saying showcase all your goods. I'm not saying that. You could do it with class, but, like, definitely just take pride in your appearance. It doesn't hurt to comb your hair in the morning. It doesn't hurt to, like, just, you know, just you know, be up a bit and be like, I got this. This is going to be it. Um, you know, I don't wear team gear or team wear, as some people call it. Uh, at my last dealership, they, they were thinking about it, and I said, listen, if you make me wear a damn polo shirt, I'm out. I quit because the polo shirt is not going to match my crinoline. It's not going to match my high heels. <laughs> so my, my boss was like, I get it. I'm like, I'll do it maybe for an event if I have to, but I'm not going to be happy. Um, but, yeah, that is my style. I just, in my, again, in my head, it's, it's, I'm, I'm living the Mad Men episode every day, literally. So Facebook Nation, understand that. That uh, high heels do not go with polos. Okay, they do not. Buddy, that is a style tip. Well, polyester team gear does not go with four inch heels. It does not. Nope. <laughs> I want to go back a little bit to like when you started in sales, your first month. Okay. Yeah. I know you said I can run circles around those guys. I know I can. And when you entered that first month, did you knock it out of the park? Um, I let me see. I think my first month I did fourteen. 14 cars. Um, again, this is Volvo World um, and, and a high volume brand or a domestic brand, 14 cars a month is nothing. But uh, for Volvo standards, it is. So, uh, and it was hard because again, I didn't have proper training. I didn't uh, know Reynolds and Reynolds, the infamous blue screen of death. Uh, I didn't know the proper procedures of when you get the customer in, deposits and all that. So I learned and I stumbled a lot. I stumbled a lot, uh, but it's a learning process. And then when I went to Danbury, my first three weeks, I sold 19 cars. Um, and again, that was only with, I think, four months into being a salesperson. Um, here, my first 17 days, I sold 15 cars. Wow. So, um, you know, it's just it's a process. And, you know, I fail sometimes too. Sometimes I have deals that fall through. Sometimes things don't work out the way they should. Uh, but you just, if you are attentive to your customer, if something fails and you just kind of, instead of just dropping in saying, all right, well, I, that, that deal failed, so I'm not going to call them again. No, just follow it through. Um, it works out. You know, I've had customers cancel deals on me and because I've been so nice and persistent and they're, they've come back. Like, you know what? I know two weeks ago I was going to buy this car. It didn't work out. I want to buy this car again. Okay, cool. I am here for you. And I always let customers know that even if they don't buy the car for me or they go to another brand, my finishing email with them is always, look, if you need anything, let me know. I am here for you. I might not have sold you the car, but just know that I'll be here. And many times they love that. And I've had customers buy my car, even if my car is more expensive, because they know they're going to get that customer service. Cool. You know, I've had a lot of people reach out and they, they wanted me to ask one single question. Okay? okay. And I think this is awesome because you have a lot of ladies going to be watching this. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ladies in the car business that, that, you know, look for somebody to follow basically, you know, who can I follow in the car business? It's just a bunch of men. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want to know, do you find it any difference from customers being a woman compared to uh, you see the way they interact with men in the business? Oh yeah. So, advantage um it's a double-edged sword 
So as a woman in the car business, you know, we are a little bit more softer. We're a little bit more nurturing. Uh, we could adapt more to different personalities. So if I have a customer that's a little bit more meek, I could tone myself down to accommodate them. If I have a customer that's loud and outrageous, I could do that as well because I am Dominican and I am extra. So I could be loud, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Trust me. I will throw glitter everywhere. It will be a party all day. But if that's not what you're into, that's cool, too. So there is that advantage. Um, but then the disadvantage is I have gotten customers who look at me and they think she knows nothing or you're just trying to sell me a car or you're just, you know, spitting out a technical sheet. Um, and I'm quick to tell them, like, listen, my dad's a mechanic. I've owned three of these cars. I, know, I have a Volvo tattooed on my arm. I don't think your average salesperson is going to do that. Um, and I'm like, I could pretty much, you know, take apart this car for you verbally and you wouldn't even know what hit you. And then they look at me like, oh, my gosh, she really knows what she's talking about. And I go deep into the car. Like, what is it you want to know? Because clearly you feel like you know more than I do. So when I question them back, like, why are you giving me crap about it? They're like, I'm, oh, okay. So, yeah. I have to – hold on. I got to stop you, man. You just said you have a Volvo tattoo. I do. Is it on your arm? It's Please on my arm. Please show us. Oh, my God. Hold on. My jacket's really tight today because I'm wearing a really old uh, jacket from, like, the 70s. But can you see it? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that is my uh, 240. It was done by the amazing Kelly, uh, an expressive ink in New Jersey. She's actually done a lot of uh, this other tattoo as well. But, yeah, this, this one was supposed to be small. It was supposed to be, like, this big um, on here. It was supposed to be over here. And I went to her, and I was like, what do you think? And I went to her the day of my godfather's 80th birthday party, which was a big gala, and I had this huge, beautiful dress. And I said, I want a tattoo today, really smart. And she said, why don't we make it bigger? And I go, sure. And then she did that on my arm, like, you know, uh, where they, they place it for you. And I thought, this looks awesome. And then she did it, and I showed up to this party with a fresh tattoo, much to the dismay of my family members, because they're like, really? I'm like, what am I going to do? But I'll tell you what, that is such a huge conversation piece. Uh, the minute my customers feel like I might not be sincere or might be giving them the lip, I go, listen, I love these cars more than life itself. Let me show you how. I show them my tattoo, and they're just like, are you serious? I'm like, I know, I know. Um, and that gets them every time. But, you know, again, I keep it classy. I, I tend to, not that I tend to hide it because some of my dresses have um, shorter sleeves, but I'm not showcasing it all the time because I do have an appearance to, to, to maintain. Um, but the customers love it, you know, and I've had customers when they see me coming towards them, they're like, oh, my God, you're so well put together because they're not expecting that because they've been to other stores where, the saleswoman maybe is disheveled or is wearing, not wearing heels, or she just doesn't look the part. And me, even if my feet hurt, I will still wear heels. Well, I find that amazing that, like, how can anybody not see the authenticity of with that? You know what I mean? Yeah. And like, look, man, okay, you might have judged me for a second, but once I start dropping some knowledge on you and showing you my Volvo tattoo, I'm all in. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you couldn't say, all right, I'll listen to you. You obviously know what you're talking about, right? So I think that's good. Kudos to you because I'm telling you, when you go all in on something, that's when people start listening to you. You know what I'm saying? That's what I've noticed um, over life. When, when you go all in, that's when you get people, all right? Um, now, I want to find out, I found out that how you feel like the customer engages with you. How do you feel like your coworkers um, Take you as a lady in the business? Um, that's hard. That's hard because, uh, you know, with every new situation, you have to feel it out and you have to see how your coworkers are going to work with you. Not everyone's going to be uh, extremely warm and, and, and fuzzy. Um, so at my first dealership was great. You know, everyone at Smite, it's just a family you know, family-oriented, family-owned dealership. So it was like family for me. Um, and it was hard for me to leave that dealership. I did shed a lot of tears uh, because I knew I was going to miss that family.
family environment. The second dealership, uh, when I got there, it was during a time of change, so I really didn't get to know or spend time with my coworkers. Um, and then I had a whole new team, so basically at one point I was known as the veteran there. Um, here, it's only my first month, so I know that the first few weeks, um, you know, there were some murmurings like, what is she doing here? Who does she think she is? Why is she the number one bubble girl? And, you know, I had to tell them, like, look, I worked really hard to get to that point. You know, I was hashtagging myself number one Volvo girl before I even got into the car industry. So, and that is why, actually, I got recognized by corporate, because I would go to these events and hashtag myself, and they saw me as a brand influencer. So, I have to explain that to people, like, this is not because I'm selling cars. This is something that I live I eat, breathe, and live on a daily basis. Like I always tell my coworkers, first comes the brand, second comes the dealership, and then third comes me. And I represent the brand 24-7. Uh, if I go to an event and I have anything that says Volvo on it, I make sure I'm on my best behavior. You know, I, I feel like uh, like I'm in the military, like you're in uniform, you can't drink, you can't do certain things because I really think that I need to represent the brand the best way I can. Uh, and the dealership, you know, at any dealership I am, I am 100% behind. I make sure that everyone knows. I make sure that, you know, when I'm at the dealership, things are where they should be. There's no garbage outside. There's no garbage inside. You know, the cars look good. If, if something doesn't look right, I make sure I let my sales manager or my general manager know. I'm just very diligent because this is the brand that I love. And if it's not being represented right, then I go into a, I go into a panic, you know. Uh, slowly, my coworkers are warming up to me, which is good. Um, but you know, I'm also doing some of BDC work, like overseeing the BDC. So you're not too happy with me right now, <laughs> because I'm very like, look, you got to do your leads, and I, I write notes that are very funny. Um, but I'm also to the point, like you know, this is money on the table. I'm not messing around. These are people that want cars. If you don't want to do what you need to do. I will give this to somebody else. I have no problem. And I sat with them and I told them, you know, I want everyone to make money. My end goal is that everyone in the dealership makes money. So if I'm nagging you about something, it's not because I'm attacking you. It's because I see potential in you and I know you could do better. And I believe in you, but you need to believe in yourself and you need to actually follow through. So instead of taking 10 smoke breaks, take five and those extra five Take that time to do your leads. And, you know, they, they get it. Very inspiring, <laughs> Mabel. For real, for real. I'm so happy you're on tonight because there's probably a lot of ladies out there listening right now that are seeing a different side of you. A lot of people don't know who you are, or they do, but they don't know this side of you, that work ethic, that, like, drive, that mm -hmm. authentic spirit you have, that unique spirit, you know? And I'm, I'm very passionately uh, impressed, okay? Uh -huh. You, it's awesome. It's awesome to see somebody else have that drive and that desire. I love it. Um, now, I want to ask you, um, is there any advice that you would give a lady that's in the car business right now or maybe thinking about making a career of this? Um, yeah, just don't give up. You know, don't be scared. Um, you know, the car world, there's, there's a lot of sharks. There's a lot of sharks out there. Um, definitely this is not for the weak, you know, if you know you're, you're more on the sensitive side, if you know that if someone makes a joke in front of you, you're going to take offense to it, or if someone yells at you, you're going to be crying. So, you know, you, um, I hate to use this term, but you have to man up. Um, sometimes you just have to take, roll with the punches, and this is not an easy industry. You're going to have days where, your car deal that you thought was going to be perfect, something goes wrong. You know, maybe the porter crashed the car, or maybe the finance fell through at the 11th hour, or maybe the customer decided they don't want that car, or maybe, I don't know, and there's so many variables in a day. Um, and as women, we tend to be a little more emotional than men, and sometimes we take things to heart. And that's one of my weaknesses is that, like, if I lose a deal, I take it personally. Like, what did I do wrong? And I really have to step outside the box and realize that some things are not in my control. So to those women that want to be, you know, want to go into the car sales, you have to realize that you cannot control everything. Okay. 
you have to roll with the punches and you have to be strong and you have to be assertive. So if you want to do this, you have to walk in head held high and like, look, I got this. This is what's happening. When you talk to customers, definitely. You could talk to them as sweet as you want. You could hug them. I don't know, hold them like a baby, feed them, whatever it is you got to do to get that deal. But when it comes down to price and they try to push your button, you have to be you have to be a shark and say, listen, listen, Sean, I know you want this XC90 at 500 a month, but the reality is this is a fully loaded XC90. And the national ad has you at 620. I could do, I could do this at six, but if you want to be below that, you're going to have to come up with money because this is a really well-equipped car. And you have to be like that. You just have to kind of have that moment, as I say, was it um, a talk with Jesus moment? You have to do that with your customers, have a poker face, and, and just do it. It works. When you start kind of finching, when you have self-doubt, customers smell that. It's just like, you know, dogs smell fear. Customers see that. They'll see right through you, and they will chew you up alive, and you will not know what hit you. Um, one thing that works out for me is I try to be as organized as possible, which is funny because when I started, I was the most unorganized person ever. I mean, I'm surprised I could even walk with two feet in front of me. And now I have notebooks everywhere because I'm like, I need to write everything down. And, you know, as I'm talking to customers, I'm writing down things. I'm even writing down like, oh, she said her dog's name was Cindy. So when I write my thank you note, oh, please give Cindy a hug for me, you know, and, and I do that. And uh, my customers love it because they're like, how do you remember these things? And meanwhile, I can't even tell you what I just had for, for, for lunch because I have no idea. But I write everything down. <laughs> Well, that was really good advice. And I, if the, the ladies that I've worked with in this business, I, if I could tell them anything, I would tell them what you told them, have a little tougher skin, a little thicker skin. If they pull the punches a little bit. We know it's a man's world and we all have to be politically, politically yeah. correct, but you know, just, just go with it a little we, bit. We, as women, yeah, as women in this industry, we have such a huge advantage because They'll never, they'll never see us as a threat. The customers will never see us and think she's going to try to get my money or she's trying to swindle me. They'll never see it. So we have that advantage. So why not use it? And definitely being honest. I tell my customers all the time, like, look, this is where you want to be. This is too much car for you. This is a car for you. If they insist that they want the more car, and I'm like, well, okay, you're going to have to come up with more money because I'm at my limit. Um, you know, I've had customers question my commission, and I'm like, look, at the end of the day, this is Volvo. This is not Toyota. <laughs> this is not, you know, a different brand. There's not that huge of a markup. And I break it down. I'm like, I'm being honest with you. This is the car. This is invoice. This is where you're at. Take it or leave it. And if you leave, if you leave that's cool. If not, I'm here. Uh, but you have to be honest. So you have to be assertive, and you have to be honest, and you cannot have self-doubt. The minute you get into your head that I'm not good enough or I can't do this or I'm a woman and I can't do this, you need to step outside that box. You need to go outside, catch some fresh air. I don't care. Message me. I will give you. There's a few ladies out there that I have been there for supporting them, and I told them, you could do it. You could definitely do it. I have your back. Um, actually, a friend of mine, Laura, just left a Subaru dealership in New Hampshire and she uh yeah, give her a shout out. Laura, what's up? She is a Mercedes fan of Springfield now. She was at a, a Subaru store and uh she was in the same boat I was like, I'm not sure if I should do this, but you know, she went big leaps and bounds because she went from a Subaru dealership to a Mercedes Benz. So you go from Subaru, which is typically, you know, an, a very utilitarian car to a Highline. And I, I don't know her personally. We know each other virtually. But I knew, and I see how she is with her customers, and I see how she is and on the forums and the way we've interacted. And I just had such a good feeling that she needed to do this. And I was like, you have to do it. You have to go high line. Trust me. No more team wear. No more, like, cargo pants. You are going to rock in Mercedes. And this is a brand-new dealership. Actually, uh, the, part, um, the sister store of her dealership is here in Long Island, and they're one of the top Mercedes stores. So I told her, you'll be foolish not to do it. And um, she did it, and she's so excited. And I'm so excited because I feel like, oh, my God, 
why can't we do that as women in this industry? We need to build each other up and push each other to do better. Uh, we cannot sit here and be content. You know, why are people always just kind of stagnant? Like, well, I'm just going to be a salesperson and that's how it is. No, aim higher. Okay, you're going to be a salesperson. Well, be the best damn salesperson you can be. You know, dabble in other things. If you're going to be a salesperson, excel in that. Be a specialist. Know the brand to the point where people call you in the middle of the night and FaceTime you, what's wrong with my car? And you can answer that, you know. Be that person at the dealership where your coworkers will go to you first for questions about the car instead of like, what should I do or where should I go? You know, let the sales managers do their thing and the general sales manager do their thing because a lot of times I see it, coworkers go into sales, like, what does this do? How does this work? Like, you should know this first and foremost. And if you don't know it, then learn it. And that's something that definitely the women that I've come across that are in this industry, I just push them to do better and do more and let them know that you might have a pretty face and you might have a nice body, but that's not what is going to sell cars. It's what's in here. It's what comes out of here. Your voice and your knowledge is what's going to get you that car deal. It is what's going to get you recruited because I've literally been recruited from dealership to dealership. I haven't gone out and lo looked for anything. Um, I, it's just been, I, I, I'm in a place and I start talking about my cars and then everyone's like, oh my God, can we hire you? And I'm like, thank you, but I can't. <laughs> All I got to say about that is boom. Okay? <laughs> that it's not about the body or the looks, it's about what's in here and what comes out of here. And I just thought that was gold. That was gold right there. I loved it. All right. so. Social media, obviously you made a large, uh, a, you know, just a focus on that. Yeah. Uh, how, how important is it in today's business? Tell these people what you think. It's funny. I had this conversation with uh, an old colleague of mine recently, and I said, uh, when I started out, even prior to the car world, um, I would always be on social media. And I would always get in trouble by my superiors. Like, you're always online. You're always on Facebook. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And family and friends were always commenting, like, you're always online. Um, it is so important to be on social media because that is the way we are talking. This is, right now, we're in social media, okay? This is the way we communicate. Uh, you like this gold pen and you're thinking about it. Next thing you know, there's a Facebook ad. You know, hey, I saw you were looking at this gold pen. And you're like, what that? What's going on? That's weird. Um, it is the way we're doing business. Uh, you know, for those that follow me know that I'm not always pushing cars. So when I do certain things about cars, it's very random that I'm like, buy this, buy this. I talk about it. I talk about myself and then I go back to the car. So I make myself more human-esque. You know, I want people to know I am a person. Yes, selling cars is my livelihood. Yes, I love these cars. But first and foremost, I am a person and I just want to talk to you. And what better way than social media? You know, there is obviously uh, a formula for it to work, and there's a formula for it not to work. Some people overdo it. Some people do it just right. And some people don't do it enough. You have to know that balance. Um, definitely know exactly what to post. You know, especially if your Instagram is public, know that you're representing your brand and that if you're going to be posting obscene things, that's not going to work out for you. It's not going to work in your favor. Um, but social media is so important. And I, and I find it interesting that you and I have similar um, thoughts about social media. I don't push cars either. You've mm -hmm. never seen me push a payment. I've never pushed a, you know, I, I say who I am and where I'm from, but we both see that you can have a presence in the market and still attract customers without pimping your, pimping your stuff. You know what I mean? And I just, I find that interesting that you do that as well. Um, why do you think you've had so much traction in social media? Um, definitely, it has helped um, with the hashtagging. I know, you know, what what hashtags will work um, because I post constant. <laughs> I post all the time, and I, I post things sometimes that are not even car related, but it gets people laughing. It gets people to notice me, um, and it's really the quality of the post. Uh, it, does it help that I have a photography degree? Maybe. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, definitely, I'm not shooting the cars in an awkward stance. You know, I definitely know what lines look good on each car. Um, but it's just I'm constantly posting. I'm constantly in your face so you don't forget about me. 
and I post my, my good days and sometimes I post my bad days. So you know that, you know what, I'm a person and it happens. But, you know, I feel that especially with social media, it's very easy to fall into constantly complaining or posting bad things. So I try my best to post things that are positive or, you know, post things like my, like yesterday I had my third customer follow me for my previous dealership to buy their second car. So right now I have three sets of customers that have bought two cars from me that came here and they're driving over two hours to come see me. So I posted it because I want people to know like, look, this is a good thing that's happening to me. You could be part of this, this club, the Mabel club. So why not? Uh, And it works out that way. You know, a lot of times, especially with the news and Facebook, there's so much negativity out there that if you post something positive, something that's going to make someone smile or laugh, it's good. You'll be remembered. Um, you know, we talked about what you would tell other ladies. I want to know, you have a lot of, you have a lot of uh, experience. You obviously know the industry very, very good. Okay. So forget about the ladies. Yeah. Tell, tell a green pea or just a new salesman. What would be the first thing that you tell them or what would be something that you think is very important they know? Carry a notebook. Carry a notebook. Don't and do not align yourself with the veteran because no. Carry a notebook. Yeah, align yourself with the veteran. Sometimes a veteran may not want to be there for you or they're too busy or they're just like, oh my God, you are a green pea, go away. Carry a notebook, take notes, study. Study the cars. If you have to, if you don't get a demo, ask to borrow a car for the night. Borrow each car and each model line and know the car. Talk to your techs, actually. A lot of salespeople forget that the service department is full of knowledge, okay? Talk to your service advisor. Talk to your techs and say, hey, about this car, what can you tell me? What is something that's really problematic on this car? Keep that in your bank right here. Because when you have a customer come in and say, I really like the S60, but I heard X, Y, Z, you just talk to a tech and you know that's not you. And you could just be like, listen, I know that too. Yeah, the oil can suck, whatever. But this is, you know, that issue is only for these model years. And this is a 17. So that has been taken care of. And they're going to look at you with like ginormous eyes like, oh, my God, you are so knowledgeable. Yeah, because you went to the service area and you picked their greens. And you sat with the service advisors and you're like, all right, what is something that a lot of people complain about this particular model? And you write it down and you go research it. You know, each car manufacturer has a portal where you get bulletins, where you get, you know, technical bulletins, sales bulletins. Familiarize yourself with that. Be the nerd. Be the nerd at your dealership because being the nerd at your dealership is going to get you a lot of green. So you're going to go from green pea to green pockets. Be the nerd. Mm -hmm. Boom. I like that. Green pea to green pockets. All right. So I obviously have figured out what your strength is. Okay. Your strength is product knowledge right off the bat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What is your weakness? Ew, my weakness. I have many. <laughs> uh, my weakness is, uh, and I'm working on it. Believe it or not, it's follow-up. It's, it's follow-up. I am working my best. Actually, at this dealership, I've done better with my follow-up than I have at my two previous dealerships. Uh, But it's definitely following up with the customer because I do set such a high expectation uh, with the customer and myself. And after the sale is done, you cannot close the book because guess what? They're going to, they're going to talk about you to their friends and family. You have to continue that line of communication because I don't believe in this is a car I'm selling. I believe in this is a relationship I'm building. You're going to buy another car for me. You're going to tell people about me and they're going to buy cars for me. If you look at it as, oh, I just sold another car, I just made my number, the, our customers are not numbers. Our customers are people. And those customers will give you more customers if you treat them accordingly. If you treat them like a number, then they're going to see through it and they're not going to want to deal with you. Um, so my weakness is definitely my follow-up. I have to be a little bit more diligent after the sale. And I try my best. You know, um, I make sure that they do follow me on social media so they see what's happening. Uh, I, you know, lately I've been sending birthday cards out, which I never did. I would always send an email, but now I'm actually sending a birthday card. I'm using this uh, thing called uh, Pixel Note. 
and it's this really cute little postcard and it goes automatically to them. I don't have to pay for anything. I just, you know, it's like $2 and they do everything for me. So that has helped me because otherwise I forget. I'll have cards in my car and then they're there for like two, three months. <laughs> All right, so you just made the move to this new dealership, okay, mm-hmm. after getting in another one. Um, where do you see yourself in like five yeah. years? E- okay, five years. Um, I know ideally my current team would, would want me to say I want to be here. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Carl. Um, and I would. I think uh, it's weird because even though I've only been here months, I feel like I've been here for years, if that even makes any sense. Um, I've adapted quickly, and I see how hard this team works, and I'm really impressed. They are a really tight machine. Um, I've, never seen, I've never seen that before, the way they, they do things. But ideally, I want to be at corporate. You know, my end goal has always been to be at Volvo Corporate. I mean, you know, I go to a lot of events. Uh, A lot of people in corporate know me. Uh, They know of me or they've heard of me. Um, And I would love to. I mean, there's nothing in the world. I I just feel that having someone that has been at a dealership level moving up to corporate would be beneficial for both parties, especially, you know, corporate has a certain way of, of doing things and they have a vision, but when it trickles down to the dealerships, and it happens with all car manufacturers, there's a lot lost in translation. And I want to be that middle person. I want to, I don't know, if I could go to every dealership and show them how to do the white glove service that I do with my customers, I feel like that would be amazing. Actually, it's funny, our former CEO, Lex, once told me that if he had a Mabel in every Volvo dealership, he would be a really happy man because he knows that they would be selling lots of cars. And uh, I still I still remember that. And I'm like, you know what? I wish I could clone myself, but I can't clone myself 312 times. You know? So one day. Um, shout out to Volvo, all you corporate people. Go ahead and get Mabel in there. You know what's going to happen. It's going to happen. Let's just go ahead and move it along. All right. So, <laughs> um. Biggest mistake in your life that you wish would never have happened? They're not mistakes. Okay, fair They're enough. Not mistakes. They, are, they are lessons. You know, people look at things and they go, oh, I wish I didn't do that. I have regret on that or I should have done that differently. Or um, I don't look at failures as mistakes. I don't look at them as things I regret. I look at them as lessons. They are lessons that I should have learned a long time ago. Um, I'm very much into the the universe is trying to tell you something. And sometimes there are signs that we choose to ignore because we're too busy in our own world. And when it's too late, that's when things blow up. And that's when you feel like the rug was taken from under you. That's when you feel like you're rock bottom, your world is coming to an end. And you have to realize that when you're at that point where you feel that you can't even breathe because you feel like you're self-drowning, that is a universe telling you wake up. Okay, wake up. I've been showing you examples on how to change it. You've been ignoring me. This is it. You're going to start fresh. So it's not, a, it's not a mistake. It's not a regret. It's a lesson. And you could either dwell in it and, and let it take you, or you could be like, all right, look, I messed up. This is it. This is a, the situation at hand, and I'm just going to, I'm going to face it head on. So I don't have regrets because every mistake, every failure that I've had, has brought me to where I am today. If it wasn't for those things, I wouldn't be who I am or where I am today. So I'm actually very grateful, not regretful. I'm grateful for the mistakes. Um, But if I had to regret anything, anything, it would be spending more time with my dad. He passed away uh, a few years ago, um, actually like 14 years ago, and he was my best friend. And I really wish I spent more time with him. But uh, I definitely know he's very proud. I know he's looking down on me like I wish I was there because he would be in the shop right now. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm really glad you shared that with us. Um, I will say that I agree with you 100%. I believe in it. Every, every road we take ends us to where we are. And mm-hmm. uh, you should be thankful for it. You know, it, it's, it hurts you at the time when it's going on. But actually, the, the scars that it's going to leave are going to help you propel you to where you are today. So... Uh, I agree with you 100%. Now, last question I have for you before we get to the questions from the, your fans, which you've, you've got a lot in there tonight, all right? So yeah. uh, I'll let you know. Um, 
you're traveling. We're on a deserted island because we got shipwrecked. What are three albums that you have to have with you on this island? Because you know what? This island has a CD player. Okay. okay. The electric. All right. Um, the Pretty in Pink soundtrack, because I love Pretty in Pink. And I love Andy. And I am Andy, but I'm, I'm the brown version. And I love her Carmen Gia in the car. So that it's just, I love that movie. Uh, definitely um, Biggie Smalls, because I love Biggie. Which one? Um, hmm. That's going to be hard. It's going to have to be a compilation because I can't, you know. I mean, I named my cat Kitty Smalls in honor of Biggie Smalls. Right. And uh, the third, hmm, it would have to be, I'm trying to think. <laughs> it's a Spanish singer called Fernandito Villaluna. He's, uh, they call him El Mayimbe. He's Dominican. And growing up, that album was playing nonstop in my house. Uh, Merengue was playing all the time. But that album, my mom must have played it. So it worked. The album worked. Um, and it always brings me to a good place because it reminds me of my childhood and, and uh, the cooking and, and all that. So definitely... Pretty in Pink, Biggie Smalls, and Fernandito Villalona, which is completely, they're all over the place. Right. You know? No, that's good. That's eclectic. And yeah. I have now with Biggie Smalls. In fact, I, I would like him to be my intro every time. I love Oh, I, lo I love Biggie Smalls. It's funny. Um, I do have a quick story on Biggie Smalls. So when I was in high school, uh, my friends decided to go to, to Brooklyn to buy things that they shouldn't be buying, and they bought something that they shouldn't be buying from Biggie Smalls. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And uh, I saw him, he was on the corner wearing a, a, a Gucci, Gucci sweater. And I'm like, who is that guy? That guy is huge. Um, and it turned out it was Biggie Smalls. So that is my Biggie Smalls, six degrees of separation. <laughs> All right, so I got some questions now. We're gonna take some questions. Okay. Uh, Lauren asked, okay, she asked, how do, you, how do you see the car business has affect your personal life? Uh, because she's been in it five years, she says. And she really, it's, it's hard for her to actually get, uh, get going in her personal life, marriage, kids, things like that. Have, have you found it to be hard? It is very hard. Um, I am single. I don't have children. I'm going to be 40 next year in April. Uh, and it is very hard. It's hard to find time. You know, my hour, especially now, my hours are 11 to 8. So there's no real time for me to go out and date or try to meet people um, I also have a very low BS tolerance because I'm in this business. I can kind of read people immediately. And uh, I've tried to go on dates. I've tried to meet people. But, you know, it, it's just a hard thing to do. And, you know, I, I told myself starting 2018, I'm going to make sure I make more time for that. Uh, definitely once I move a little bit closer, I'm going to have a little bit more time. But it's it's meeting the right quality people. Uh, again, it's not a numbers game. It's it's quality over quantity. And to find someone that I feel I can become compatible with and that has the same um, ambition that I do, that has the same vision I do, it is really hard. So I told myself I'd rather be by myself than to be in bad company. And uh, sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not, you know. It happens. Sometimes you get lonely. You're driving home like I have no one to talk to or, oh, my God, it's just going to be me and the cat again. But it, it's part of the, part of this world, you know, part of this automotive world. You have a cat at home? How many cats do you have? One, Kitty Smalls. <laughs> she is the size of two, though, because she's huge. Your she's cat's name. Kitty Smalls? Kitty Smalls. Oh, I love it. That is she's great. the illest. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't name it like Volvo or x No, no. And I, I decided I might get a second cat and his name is going to be Tupac. <laughs> Who's better, Tupac or Biggie Small? Biggie, Biggie all day. Okay, I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I want to thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Okay, thank you. it's really been awesome because I've learned a lot tonight. I've learned a little bit about you. Uh, I've learned a little bit about women in the car business. I've learned about um, what it's like selling a different product. You know, I, most of the people I've talked to so far are sa selling more of a uh, um, a volume-based product than a specialized product. And mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty cool to, to, uh, to have met you tonight. Now, why don't you tell everybody how to follow you and get a hold of you? 
Well, it's easy. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm on there as Bella Mabella. That's B-E-L-L-A-M-A-B-E-L-L-A. -L 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 uh, definitely add me on Facebook, Mabel Peralta. If you needed to contact me or call me, my cell phone, uh, work-related, guys, disclaimer, it's uh, 516-21-VOLVO. <laughs> Well, I will say this, Mabel, I think everybody really enjoyed, enjoyed this. Uh, you had a lot of viewers in here at one time. I'm sure it's going to have a lot of views. And uh, ladies, share it to the other ladies. We need to get as many people to hear this, to follow, to, to come together and have women in, women in uh, auto sales. What do, you, what, do, what do you guys go to every year? There's like a convention. It's called Women in Automotive, uh, and it's amazing. I'm going to go to it this year. Uh, Subi is going to be there. She is an amazing person. There's so many women within the automotive world that actually I look up to as mentors. Uh, Lisa Copeland, actually, I saw her at a digital dealer once, and she was talking about, you know, you know, she worked with Fiat and everything, and she was talking about how she does things. And I, all I saw was this beautiful Amazon Texan woman with the beautiful dress and super high heels. And I thought, I that is. That is what I want to be. I want to be Lisa Copeland. She is freaking awesome. Like, look at her. And she commanded the room. Like, she was in there like, this is me. What's up? Hair flip. I got this. And from that moment on, I'm like, I could do this. If she could do it, I could do it. And I really try my best to make sure that I am there for anyone that comes to me. And sometimes I have complete strangers send me messages like, I don't know you, but I follow you, and this is my situation. And I even have men that do that, too. And I'm like, all right, let's work. Let's work it out. What is your issue? What is holding you back? Why do you feel you can't achieve more than you can? And, you know, and that's how it is. You know, even if I don't have time, I make sure I at least do, like, a voice recording for them. Like, all right, look, I'm, I'm with customers. I haven't forgotten about you. Let's talk about it. I just want to be there for, for everyone, especially the women in automotive, because there are some very dark sides, unfortunately, and sometimes you feel like you don't have a voice, and you do have a voice, and know that you do have support. Well, that's what I wanted to have you on for. That's why I wanted you to be the first lady on here. I wanted, I knew that you were very helpful, and I think that's so important because um, I, I, like you, get those texts at all hours of the night, all the time, hey, I've been in this situation, can you help me out with this? Can you help me out with that? And I always want to help people too. And I saw that genuinely in you. And I think it's very important that we have that. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. Okay. Sales Hustler Spotlight with our first lady, number one Volvo girl, Mabel Peralta. Okay? <laughs> and uh, we got to get her to move because she's driving four hours a day in a car. And uh, that's crazy. But uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank you guys for supporting us, us every week. All I want to do is spotlight you guys across the nation. That's it. Okay. That's what this is about. There's a lot of great people out there, man. A lot of people doing amazing things in this auto business. And we have to get the word out and show everybody, man. That's what this was originated for. I want to thank Quick Page. I want to thank Quick Page and Chad Morgan for sponsoring this. Hi, Chad. <laughs> Free service. Um, it's an amazing app. Uh, for those of you guys who are not doing video right now, get involved with video. I don't care what you use. Just do it. It is the future and the present. Um, guys, I'll see you all next week. Um, I'll tell you in a couple days who our, uh, who our guest is. I don't want to expose that yet. But uh, Mabel, say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. And uh, Sean Hayes here. We're out of here. Goodbye. <laughs>